Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about ethical naturalism. It says, whatever is explicable is in the ambit of nature. Now, uh, this is a very, uh, this is a meta ethical theory, which talks about the role of nature in understanding the moral domain. Now, let us take a moment to reflect on uh, our understanding of the world. Now, ethical naturalism, as you could uh, uh, surmise, then, uh, uh, the uh, origin of the word naturalism is coming uh, the, from the word nature. Now, what is naturalism? How, what is ethical naturalism? And what is it as a meta ethical theory? Now, you would recollect that earlier, we have talked about various uh, ethical theories. Now, we are uh, dealing with uh, meta ethics, which is the foundation of ethical theories. The very possibility of morality, the very justification of the ethical domain. Now, today we are going to talk about something called ethical naturalism. Uh, if you look at the slide, it reads that well, whatever is, is explicable in the ambit of nature. Now, uh, stay with this for a while, and let it not confuse us that well, what is there in the ambit of nature is enough, or the domain of nature is enough to un, uh, explain, analyze or understand everything in the cosmos. Now, let us uh, go ahead to see what do we exactly mean by this? Well, first, what is naturalism? Naturalism is a metaphysical or a philosophical theory, that claims that the universe is totally explicable, in the parlance of nature. That is, we do not need to postulate any supernatural notion, to complete our understanding of the universe. Well, what is a natural entity? Is it the same thing as uh, empirical, as an empirical entity? Well, okay. now let us take a moment to reflect on, what is uh, naturalism. Now, naturalism is a philosophical metaphysical theory, of which ethical naturalism is a derivative or a component. Now, naturalism as the uh, very name suggests, uh, gives importance or uh, foundational importance to nature. Now, by nature we do not necessarily confine ourselves to trees, plants, and wildlife, as uh, one interpretation of it could have. But well, uh, when we talk in philosophy uh, about nature, we mean everything that is uh, empirically uh, perceivable, that is comprises of the cosmos. Perhaps, this is one uh, concept, that can easily be understood, if we understand, uh, if we give examples of what is not nature. Uh, well, things that are postulations, or entities that are supernatural, starting from uh, the postulation of God as a supernatural entity, of mystery, of uh, uh, unexplicable uh, intuitive uh, power. Now, these are uh, uh, examples of supernatural notions, and this would make, uh, uh, th this is clearly out of the ambit of nature. So, clearly nature is not, uh, uh, as uh, the philosophical understanding of naturalism would go ahead, it is not confined to just, uh, what many botanists or biologists or people would believe, to be only plants, trees, animals and uh, life on earth. But, it comprises of everything, that is almost empirical, that we can know and perceive, that is not strange, that is explicable. So, naturalism by that uh, currency, is a very powerful or all encompassing theory. When we seek an explanation, for a behavior. When we seek that well, uh, Venus is passing over uh, 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 the sun, to the other side. Now, we seek a natural explanation to this, which is that well, uh, the uh, satellites or planets revolve in their orbits, and their orbits uh, 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 sometimes overlap each other, and therefore, there is an overlap in their uh, paths. Now, this is a purely naturalistic explanation in the ambit of nature. But, if I say, if I postulate that, well, uh, uh, one planet is a life form, which is visiting another planet, or that God is arranging the motions of uh, uh, these satellites. Well, these are supernatural explanations. So, now, as we would see, most of the disciplines, that we uh, study, most of our knowledge in the world, 
is quite naturalistic. We know that well, uh, examples of naturalism would be that well, uh, if I take this kind of a drug, I have uh, seen that drug X empirically correlates with the uh, phenomenon Y. So, doctors prescribe a drug X to uh, treat the phenomena Y or uh, likewise. Now, this is a very naturalistic explanation, but what if the doctor tells you that, why do not you go and pray for the uh, uh, healing of your uh, uh, condition. Now, that is a supernatural uh, uh, claim that well, uh, having having uh, praying as a form of treatment is not naturalistic, is not go, uh, governed by natural laws as we know them. It is, it is a part of uh, uh, a supernatural domain. Now, well having known this explanation, perhaps we would think that well, uh, most of uh, the way the, the way the world works is naturalistic and most of the studies that we do and knowledge that we have is naturalistic and uh, that is all. Uh, why this talk of supernaturalism? Well, okay. now, uh, so having uh, had a little clarity about uh, what is naturalism, let us proceed to see what is ethical natura, uh, naturalism and then try to analyze it as a theory. So, I repeat what naturalism would mean that it is a metaphysical and philosophical theory that claims that the universe is totally explicable in the parlance of nature. We do not need to postulate any supernatural notion to complete our understanding of the universe. What is a natural uh, entity? Is it the same thing as empirical? Yes, mostly when we are understanding natural entities or uh, we are naturalistic in our understanding, we would comprise almost everything empirical. However, uh, rational truths or uh, self evident truths are or can also be subsumed under the domain of naturalism. So, what cannot be subsumed under the domain of naturalism is what we would generally understand as mystery or something which is supernatural. So, as we see mystery, supernatural as something which is as not natural. Now, coming on to the next slide, let us take a look at what is ethical naturalism. Now, ethical naturalism is a variant of metaphysical naturalism and it claims that ethical claims can be analyzed into natural facts and properties. The domain of ethics can be understood without any assumption of the supernatural or mysterious. It is complete within the natural order, that there is no mystery or explanatory gap in the understanding of the ethical domain. Now, let us proceed step by step into understanding what exactly do we mean by ethical naturalism. Ethical naturalism is a variant of metaphysical uh, naturalism. So, naturalism is the broader uh, theory, which talks about uh, explanation of any domain in terms of in the natural parlance. Ethical naturalism specifically confines itself to the domain of ethics, which can be understood in terms of natural facts and properties. The domain of ethics uh, can be understood without any assumption of the supernatural or mysterious, it is complete within the natural order. Now, let us take a look. If uh, we are ethical naturalists, what are we saying? We are saying that well, what is it for an action to be right or wrong or good or bad? These classifications can be analyzed uh, and explained in uh, terms of natural facts and properties. Now, does it appear uh, very obvious or a little uh, problematic? Let us take a look. What are we? What is? What would an ethicist mean, or what would uh, this uh, meta-ethical claim mean of uh, uh, claiming that all ethical uh, uh, claims can be reduced or can be understood in terms of natural claims. That means, ethical claims can be, for example, be psychologically felt. 
not intuitively felt. So, when they are saying say, uh, uh, when I can feel something as right or wrong, which is uh, uh, clearly, uh, what ethicists would not like to mean similar to intuition, because that would be a part of supernatural domain. So, I will give you an example, perhaps to make uh, things clearer. We will talk about it in detail, say, uh, when I say, what gives me happiness, is the right thing to do. Now, we have talked about a moral uh, theory, which has this as its premises. So, what gives me happiness, is the right thing to do. If that is the case, then I am equating what is right, with what is uh, with happiness, which is a very natural phenomena that I feel. Now, in this case, so uh, looking at the slide, the presentation slide, we see that there is, and the third bullet would be saying, that there is no mystery, uh, or explanatory gap in the understanding of the ethical domain. So, we need not postulate anything supernatural to explain the ethical domain. Now, coming to the next slide. Well, what is an example of ethical naturalism? Perhaps, uh, it is clearer, uh, one would be clearer about ethical naturalism, when we see an example of ethical naturalism. Say, for example, an action x, brings along suffering which is a natural property, because it can be felt by the agent. Whereas, action y, brings about no suffering in anybody. Thus, one ought to choose x over y. This is the moral claim. Assuming, one values the absence of suffering over its presence. This is our assumption. Now, this ought claim, or a value claim, can be understood in terms of natural property. And what is that natural property? That natural property is suffering. Now, let us look at this uh, claim. It appears quite simple, and perhaps most of us would agree with it. That, if an action brings along suffering, whereas action y brings about no suffering. x gets suffering, action x gets suffering, action y gets no suffering. So, most of us would perhaps choose x over y. Well, if that is the case, then we are making, uh, if that is the case, and we go ahead and make a prescription, make a moral claim, that x is the right thing to do, over y, or x is right, and y is wrong, or x is good, and y is evil, or that one ought to choose uh, x over y, we are making this as a value claim. Now, if, if this is a value claim, what is the basis of the value claim? The basis of the value claim is suffering, and what gives it objectivity is that, well, of the two choices x and y, one gets more suffering than the other. Suffering is a natural phenomena, which can be experienced and felt psychologically, not intuitively. It can be felt and experienced psychologically, and this ought claim, therefore, can be understood, in terms of a natural property and suffering. So, this is an example of ethical naturalism. Now, let us go ahead to the next slide. Now, what does it mean? That therefore, suffering is bad, it is to be avoided, and the lack of it is good, uh, and is to be aimed at. Well, the moral theory, utilitarianism comes to mind. This is the moral theory, that I was referring to. It is a classical example of ethical naturalism. Utilitarianism is a classical example of ethical, ethical naturalism, wherein the parameter of good and bad, is the natural or psychological property of happiness and suffering. Thereof, ethical naturalism faces many of the difficulties, that utilitarianism faces. Now, let us take a look at the assumptions, that we have come across. That suffering is bad, and the lack of suffering is good that, uh, to put it more simplistically, happiness is de desired over uh, uh, suffering, and that this is 
how the case ought to be is what ethical naturalists say. Now, if you would recollect from our earlier and uh, discussion on utilitarianism, what we meant was well, uh, utilitarianism is a moral theory that uh, promotes the greatest good of the greatest number, that, that wants uh, uh, judges right and wrong by the psychological uh, feeling of happiness and sorrow, which seemed quite obvious. But the meta ethical assumption for utilitarianism was uh, ethical naturalism. Now, we did not talk about the meta ethical assumption, because these are perhaps sometimes so implicit, that we take it for granted. But, when we explore the foundations of uh, any moral theory, we are bound to arrive at uh, uh, deeper philosophical claims. And naturalism here is one such of an example, because this such a philosophical claim would entail its uh, uh, and would colour the moral theory, that is based on such a claim. Now, for uh, uh, utilitarianism, ethical naturalism is the foundational meta ethical claim. And what is the meta ethical claim? That well, suffering, uh, it is true as an empirical fact, that uh, human beings or living uh, entities prefer uh, uh, the lack of suffering over suffering that, this is what ought to be the moral parameter, or the ethical parameter, is the claim of naturalism. That, when I can make a judgement, that well, uh, one ought to. Now, let us, let us take a look at the board. A simple claim, like suffering is worse than no suffering. Suffering is worse than no suffering, or no suffering is better than suffering. Now, if we make a second claim, suffering is bad. Are these two claims, one and two, the same thing? That is the question, that the, this is the uh, division, that would bring about uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, presence of the meta ethical claim, in this moral theory. Now, if you agree that suffering is worse than no suffering, well, uh, I, I, I understand that these are very generic statements, and well, one could uh, argue for various gradations of suffering. What exactly do we mean by suffering? But let us take it in the most generic sense that you would like to understand. In whichever sense you would like to understand suffering, uh, or in whichever degree or uh, uh, magnitude you would like to understand suffering, hold on to that magnitude. And if you agree that suffering is worse than no suffering, say um, uh, studying overnight in the lack of sleep for an examination is also suffering. Now, if that suffering is worse than no suffering, you would rather sleep peacefully, uh, or watch a movie and sleep peacefully, rather than study. So, you are suffering, when you are preparing for your examinations. Then, suffering is bad, would you say that? Well, uh, it seems a very intuitive jump from 1 is to 2, that well, suffering is worse than no suffering. Well, uh, suffering is bad. Well, this jump is only possible, if you are holding an ethical naturalism, as a meta ethical claim. Therefore, if there is, if you believe that well, what is bad, or uh, suffering is something that you uh, do not desire, you desire to stay away from, uh, then that makes it bad. So, you are therefore, making a naturalistic claim. So, uh, suffering is bad, or the equivalent of it, that one ought not to encourage suffering, 
that one ought not to encourage suffering. Now, such claims that suffering is bad, and one ought not to uh, encourage suffering, assumes that uh, this is a value claim, this is a psychological fact, or a natural fact. Now, this value claim, uh, can be derived from this uh, factual, uh, or psychological uh, fact, only if we have this middle assumption of ethical naturalism. Now, most of our ethical, as, uh, uh, or meta ethical assumptions are uh, uh, almost implicit, and very subtly implanted in the way we think. And therefore, it is uh, sometimes too obvious, or too trivial for us to uh, be true. Because, consider this, when we have a difference of opinion, it could uh, mostly be a difference in the theory, or the meta ethical claim that we have. Now, somebody who is not an ethical naturalist, um, would be of the opinion that, well yes, psychologically I would prefer uh, no suffering over suffering. But that does not make suffering anything evil or wrong, because suffering could be uh, on its way uh, to a greater goal, or suffering could be a, a way that human beings, uh, there are various uh, uh, explanations given. Suffering could be uh, a means to get the best out of human beings, and various other uh, uh, claims. So, thereby making uh, a claim that, well suffering is uh, bad, and uh, suffering is not bad. In fact, that two cannot be arrived from one. So, that is an example of a non-naturalist claim. Now, uh, this is one of the difficulty, as we look at the slides. This is one of the difficulty, that the ethical naturalist uh, faces. Because, this is a difficulty also, which is faced by the utilitarianism. How can one move from a factual claim, to a value claim? This is a question, which we will tackle later, in context of a particular philosopher, called David Hume. That, how do we move from a factual claim, to a value claim? Uh, for instance, now let us take an example. Suppose, I do an action B, which is, buy a DVD of a movie, I saw at my friend's place. and liked it. It has a small budget, and a new maker. Implying that, uh, insufficient, or just barely sufficient funds. Now, if I do this act B, what could be the reason? Now, I have already uh, watched a movie, I do not intend to watch it again. Let me mention that too. Do not intend to re-watch, or narrow cast, or share it with anybody else or I do not have any uh, value for um, keeping it as a collector's item. I purely buy a DVD of this movie, which I have seen as a vote to the uh, movie maker. Now, why do I do this B? I do this B, uh, probably, uh, I do this B, not probably, but definitely to transfer resources to the movie maker. Now, why would I like to transfer resources to the movie maker? Well, first, to encourage the movie maker, to, to provide resources, say money, to settle dues, or invest in new project. 
Now, if this is basically the reasoning that I go through, that I buy a DVD of a movie, which I saw at my friend's place, I like the movie, but I do not intend to rewatch the movie, or to narrow cast it to anybody, or to have it have a, as a collector's item. I see that the movie is a small budget movie by a new movie maker, so barely uh, she, uh, the movie maker uh, would be having sufficient funds. So, I decide to buy uh, a DVD or a set of DVDs of the same. Uh, my aim is to transfer resources to the movie maker. Uh, I also recommend others, as I make a moral claim that one ought to buy one ought to do B, if one has liked the movie and shares the same conditions. Now, uh, now what is it that makes an action B, uh, morally evaluable? Well, the reason for it, it can be two. The first is to encourage the movie maker, which is psychological, and to provide resources uh, or money to settle dues for the old movies made, or to invest in a new movie that the director is making. So, material. Nevertheless, both these of both of these are natural facts. So, that is an example of a um, ethical naturalism foundation, that well, if I am an ethical naturalist, I would like to wish, I would like to uh, buy a DVD or a set of DVDs, even though I do not have any use for it, as a matter of uh, psychologically encouraging the movie maker, and uh, providing him resources to settle his or her dues, or to invest in a new project. Now, what if I were not an ethical naturalist? Now, if I were not an ethical naturalist, I would silently say, I would silently thank the maker. Now, that does not have any natural ramifications. So, uh, other uh, school or other, other ways of looking at an ethical naturalist domain would be that, well, uh, to um, play the devil's advocate to argue that, what uh, who is not an ethical naturalist could argue that, well, my silently thanking the maker, could turn uh, the attention of cosmos towards the maker. So, something as uh, uh, unusual, or which in today's parlance is as unbelievable as uh, a good wish, which is, uh, which does not even serve as a psychological encouragement. That uh, for an ethical naturalist, that has uh, no value, and that cannot be incorporated into uh, an ethical uh, domain. Now, let us look at a few more uh, clarifications. Well, ethical naturalism and moral realism. Now, what is realism? We have talked about this term realism quite often. Uh, realism in philosophy would mean that, uh, an object or an entity is real, if it exists independent of the perceiver. A very bare, simple, uh, but uh, uh, rigid definition of what is something, what is it for something to be real. So, realism is opposed to, uh, being the mere figment of imagination, or creation of the mind. So, realism, uh, or moral realism would mean that, well, there are uh, moral facts, which are independent of the perceiver. That moral facts do not, uh, are not figments of imagination, or creations of uh, uh, mind, and thereof. Uh, uh, differ from person to person, but there is something real about it. Let us take a look at what the slide reads. Now, moral realism claims that, ethical claims can be classified as true or false. Now, when anything is real, uh, or claimed to be under the purview of realism, can uh, any that claim can be judged as true or false. Thus, for, mor for the moral realist, there is an objective criteria of determining the truth value of moral judgments. The ethical naturalist, is a moral realist, as far as the ethical naturalist. As for the ethical naturalist, there are criteria, to serve as the criteria for validating ethical judgments. Now, take a moment to read these uh, bullets by yourself. Okay, now, let us try to understand, what do we mean by, ethical naturalism, and its relation to moral realism.
So, what are moral realists? Moral realists claim that there is an objective criteria for determining the value of truth value of moral judgments. How are these to be determined? Well, that depends on the parameter that you take. So, moral realist uh, is not claiming how, it is only explaining that it is, it should be determinable. Now, one of the answer to this how is ethical naturalism. Well, because the ethical naturalist is a moral realist. As for the ethical naturalist, there are criteria to serve as the criteria for validating ethical judgments. What are these uh, criteria? These criteria are natural facts and properties. But, there can be other answers to the same question. So, there can be moral realists, who are not ethical naturalists. Now, let us uh, take a look at them. Obviously, all moral realists are not naturalists, as there are realists, who assert the objectivity of moral judgments, without resorting to natural facts or properties. Kant's categorical imperative or Ross ethical rules, are examples of moral realism, but not ethical naturalism. Now, let us take a look at, what, what do we mean by uh, moral realism. Well, realism first meant that, well, entities exist independent of the perceiver. Moral realism meant that, well, there can, uh, moral claims can be true or false. Why can they be true or false? Because, there is an objective criteria in determining their truth or falsity. Hence, the word realism applied to moral, uh, the uh, term moral. So, moral realism is saying that, there can be objective uh, right and wrong. How can there be objective right and wrong? Because, there is a parameter, there is an answer book, there is a manual or a code or something out there, with which we need to verify. What is this something, with which we can verify? Here is where ethical naturalism is an answer, to uh, uh, the uh, index, uh, posed by uh, moral realism. It is like uh, this, that moral realism claims, that there is an answer to moral question. How do you find out the answer, is what the ethical naturalist, uh, un, uh, is, uh, uh, how do you find out the answer, is what ethical naturalists, uh, do. That they find out the answer, by uh, going back to, or, uh, or analyzing it, in the uh, natural terms, in the terms of nature, uh, or natural facts or properties. Are there other answers possible? Yes, there are other answers possible. Um, one can be a deontologist, a Kantian deontologist, claiming that, well, uh, the categorical imperative determines right and wrong. One can be a uh, a, a rule follower as Ross, that well, these are the set of rules, and as long as you uh, confirm with these, it is right. As long as you do not concur with these, they, it is wrong. So, they are also moral realists. So, naturalism is a part, is, is a kind of moral realism. But of course, all moral realists do not have to be ethical naturalists, because there can be other parameters for uh, assessing uh, moral judgments. So, as we see that well, uh, ethical naturalism is a part of moral realism, but uh, is not, uh, does not uh, occupy the whole of the space of ethical naturalism.